Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Rupa, and this is the first Netlink workshop at NetDev, uh, chaired by David Ahan and me. David is on the panel there. And we have others as well. Johannes, <laughs> who is uh, <laughs> you're invited, and he's an honorable guest. And uh, he's been contributing a lot to Netlink recently as well. And we have other speakers. Let's go over the agenda. So introduction, I will ramble along for a few minutes, giving a brief high-level overview on Netlink. Uh, David Ahern will cover Netlink updates. And then we have a long lunch break. We will come back, and David Ahern will resume talking about Netlink filtering. Um, Netlink filtering is basically like just the previous uh, workshop. There was a lot of TCP filtering. So TCP info filtering, the same thing. Uh, and um, Somini and Jamal will talk about use cases, deployment, netlink challenges, and uh, basically scale challenges with filtering. And we have a section on new netlink APIs that are growing each day. Uh, Jiri will talk about devlink and uh, eth tool. Michael will talk about eth tool. So, okay. So, yeah. Waiting for my slides to appear. Yes. Oh, they have to switch out files. What? They have to switch out files. Yeah, he's switching. He has all the files. It's all there. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, of all the people, I think I'm the least awake today. I've just slept for two, two hours, so you can ask all the questions to the panel there. So, yeah, so I'll, very high level overview. I'm keeping it light. Um, um, yeah, I don't know, I, I'm fascinated by the cat, cat art in Prague, so if anybody has any info on them, please unicast me or talk to me. Um, Brief intro to Netlink. Well, read the man page. There's a link to the man page. Netlink, as you know, is used to transfer information between kernel and user space. And Netlink is also used as an IPC between uh, user space processes. But this workshop is only about kernel and Netlink. Sorry, uh, kernel and user space. So Netlink has a standard socket interface, uh, as shown there. Socket family actually selects the kernel module or Netlink group to communicate with. And there is a list of uh, socket families or Netlink families in the man page. Let's, this, uh, I'll highlight or talk about two major Netlink families, Netlink route and Netlink generic. A few thoughts as along, I was uh, trying to scan through all the implementations or all the subsystems that uses each one of them. Netlink route uh, is nothing but RT Netlink subsystem, dictates the message type and handlers allows the user to register only a certain fixed message types. Get, set, um, new. New is nothing but create and delete. And each message type can have a do it and a dump it handler. So that's constraint. RT Netlink defines this. Netlink generic, on the other hand, gives a lot of freedom to subsystem uh, API developers to declare any type of message and handlers. So. Sorry. Okay. So subsystems, just a survey on subsystems using RT Netlink route today is routing, addresses, links, stats, neighbor subsystem, namespaces, TC, um, and sysctls, RTM netconf. So, and each of these are, in some cases, they're overloaded by family types. So for example, neighbor's RT Netlink API is uh, used by, um, in, with the AF unspec family by the neighbor subsystem and with AF bridge a family uh, for the bridge FTB and uh, BXLAN FTBs. 
This is some art. This is what you do on the flight <laughs> when you have no good movies. I was just scanning through all the, um, sorry, I need to go back to the previous slide. So the link, link RT Netlink API extends itself to provide support for many types of links and that via the IFLA link info. So this is good to know because sometimes when you're adding a new link, it's usually, this is the place where you check to see if this can be extended because you can leverage a lot of uh, code, existing code. And here, the types of links that RTNet Link Ops supports are these. Um, and yeah, basically a lot of them. Bonds and bridges, we eats, uh, and so on. Subsystems using NetLink Generic, again, there are many. I did some uh, quick stats, so there are around 33. And the thing is, I think I've seen a overlap between um, RT NetLink Ops and uh, Generic. I don't want to point them here, but in general, I think if your Generic NetLink Op is supporting the same exact messages and same exact handlers, like do it and dump it, it's better, and if it's a link type, it's better to uh, have it in uh, defined as RT NL ops. So adding a new API, where would you do it? RT NetLink route or, uh, sorry, NetLink route or NetLink generic, which families? So the general uh, philosophy here is, if it fits into existing NetLink route, you can benefit from a lot of the APIs and handlers already existing. And links especially fall right into this, whether it's a tunnel link or uh, VLAN bridges and so on. So this can also be true for other subsystems. For example, like the bridge FDB uses the neighbor subsystem with the AF bridge flag. So you essentially use the same attributes from user space. Uh, you just key off, the, uh, key off the family and look for extra attributes if you're in the neighbor subsystem. You're looking at a neighbor entry or a bridge FDB entry or a VXLAN entry. So a little bit on user space and netlink. We all know user space can use one of these families and uh, send a message to kernel to create, delete, update an object, one object or get all objects. And there is also another channel which is for asynchronous no netlink notifications from the kernel. And this is usually a shared uh, bus. The kernel writes to all the listener sockets and each netlink family and message type provides you with groups that you can listen on. And these groups dictate what kind of notifications you get. For example, link notification, there is a multicast group where you can, your application can uh, register to, and you'll get link, uh, asynchronous link notifications. And the examples of user space applications using NetLink today, all of them. Uh, I work for a net network operating system distribution company, and we have all demons listening to NetLink, and we know the pain. When it scales, you get so many notifications and all the, <laughs> all the processes, whether it's DHCPD or NTP or um, your telemetry applications and routing demons, they're all listening and processing notifications, especially on link events um, at a large scale. Need for NetLink libraries. I think um, I have spent a lot of time on NetLink in user space, especially on the user space driver side and some of the networking protocol implementations which listen to NetLink and process link events and so on. And I think uh, we all know there are many library implementations out there if you're looking for it, especially if you're uh, writing in Python or Go. They are, but none of them is complete. Uh, at the end, I have a link to libnl and libmnl, which are almost complete. Uh, well, libnl is the farthest, I think, uh, in terms of supporting all the NetLink API attributes and so on. So in most cases, uh, perform for performance reasons, all applications, they do end up building their own libraries. For example, free range routing suite, if you know, there is the Zebra process which builds 
its um, routing cache and processes Netlink and so on for all attributes that it wants. So we have seen this over and over again that every, uh, like I said, in, on a network operating system, you have multiple demons all building their own Netlink parsers and Netlink uh, caching functions. So, and many of the Netlink performance problems are because of bugs, and these bugs are, trust me, they're replicated all over. Uh, socket buffers, small socket buffers, you go and scan all the demons that are listening, protocol implementations especially, they're all either low socket buffers, they're running out of socket uh, buffer space, where, on link events especially. And there's a churn in the network, everybody is processing Netlink events. So I think a lack of documentation is one thing for Netlink that we keep discussing on and off. So many, many a times it's due to applications not knowing what they should be listening to, and they are listening to all events unnecessarily. I think David is going to touch upon this more. Um, and some more thoughts here. Well, it's a long shot. I'm just going to try. Uh, can IP Route 2 support A or the kernel tree provide some kind of a Netlink library? It has to be a library that a kernel developer can submit a patch to to complete the API, which would be easier. I have seen, um, especially people new to Linux networking, struggling with um, yeah, building Netlink libraries and parsing, and they end up copying code from everywhere and copying bugs as well. So, and yes, people used to <laughs> use libc networking APIs before, and it was all standard. Now with Netlink, they have to uh, regenerate this boilerplate code. And yeah, I will, I, I'm, I think I'm not going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> so trust me, Netlink can be hard to, uh, uh, people have to read kernel code to figure out where your attribute uh, is, I mean, uh, what's the type of your attribute and so on. So Netlink documentation is key. I know we have talked about TCP info documentation and eBPF documentation and so on. So I think Netlink also needs some documentation. And yes, Netlink is a new eBPF. This is the first Netlink workshop, so hoping. <laughs> That's yeah, that's all I had. Uh, any questions so far? So just one comment. I looked at Netlink and I looked at eBPF. With the new S-Trace, Netlink is easier. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, co comment here? Uh, <laughs> Yes. Okay. Yes, your turn, Jamal. Do you want to say something? You go ahead. Oh, you don't have the mic. Okay, yeah, so. Um, you, you have a question too, right? Question. Okay, go ahead. Your so, um, yeah, can you hear me? The Netlink uh, generic, uh, how easy it is to support uh, some, something in a driver? Is it hardware offload friendly? It is like any other uh, any API. Other. So DevLink uses Genel, by the way, and uh, and as you know, DevLink was written for hardware uh, drivers. Uh, uh, in honestly, mind. I'm not sure why anyone would ever use anything other than General or Netlink Route, right? Yeah. At, at this point. Yeah. Because General just has the, all the dynamic lookup of the families. You don't have to worry about hard coding and all the things. So, so when you need something completely separate, like Wi-Fi, completely separate from, like all your methods, operations are completely separate from Netlink Route then you probably want to use Netlink generic. Right, because it gives the freedom to the developer, something which doesn't fit into the existing one. Yeah. One can define new message. Yes. And it can be interpreted. Yeah. For, for specific, and, then, and does the application tool chain also support this? Like yeah. example, like a, a TC, TC flower today, it does a Netlink event, right? Yes. Yeah, so TC for, uses uh, RT Netlink. Uh, yes, of course. Right? Okay. But uh, there are many, uh, uh, many tools in IP Route 2 that use Genel. Okay. So there are many examples. Many examples. Yeah. Okay. So Genel came in because we were running out of Netlink numbers. So I said, okay, let's have something that doesn't. So we we no need to take a new uh, number, right? For okay. for your next. Everybody was just inventing their own Netlink. Thank you. Yeah. 
So uh, yeah, my comment is, uh, with the libraries, I think the problem is, well, I guess, do we need a new library? It's like asking, uh, do we need a new love song, right? <laughs> so the problem is everybody <laughs> thinks. Do you need a love song, <laughs> <laughs> So the, the, the problem is everybody has their own knobs that they think are important. So one of my problems with LibNL, for example, it has like 15,000 hooks. Yeah. It tries to cache so for me and it doesn't do it very well. It has layers I, though. You can right, use right, the right. bottommost layer. I, I think it yeah. may have improved. I stopped looking at it at some point, but I like LibNL better. But uh, it doesn't have parsing for API, I don't want right? you to do my parsing for me. It, okay, it, see? It, you see, this is the problem, so there are different right? kinds of... Uh, mm. It's a love song, right? Which, which one do you like most, right? So I th that's yeah. always the challenge. We have to have minimalist, and if someone can build up shit on top, that's okay. I, I think we could put you in the advanced category. Yeah. So the libraries are really for the advanced. people trying to get You're started. You're a kernel developer. Yeah. yeah. Someone who has, isn't used to you know writing the, an LNG app. Yeah. No, it's about the richness. I mean, do I want all that richness, right? You don't, but others do. <laughs> Some do. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm cutting into you. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm David Ahern. I work with Rupa at Cumulus. And how do we get to the next slide deck? Sorry. All right, so I have a couple of topics I want to get into. Um, one of those is past mistakes and how that's hurting us, and then the next topic is scale. But before I do that, I want to start off with some background. Do I need to aim this at any particular spot? Theoretically, no. At the wall? Why are they? I don't know. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> user mistake. No. no? That one. The top one, yeah. Yes. No. There we go. No, there we go. All right. I touched it. No? You can even add signals. You can help you again. Any particular wall? <laughs> All right. They have an issue. Okay, so let's start with some background on what Netlink is. So it's a generic messaging infrastructure between the kernel and user space. There's an RFC that documents this from way back when it was first thought of. Uh, as Rupert pointed out, there, it's a socket-based API. So you open up the socket with AF Netlink and whatever protocol is of interest. Specifically, we're focused on Netlink Route and Netlink Generic. I'm focused on Netlink Route. Everything I've done is within RT Netlink category. In terms of the structure of the messages, you've got a message header, which contains the length, the type of message, sequence number, process ID, or port ID as it was, was changed to, and then uh, any flags associated with that message. And so this gets important into some of the complaints I have you know, coming up. Uh, so generically speaking, header, payload. That payload is then interpreted as a header based on the message type, and then a series of attributes. And those attributes are TOV based. So what's the type, what's the length, here's the value. They have to be four byte aligned. So if it's not four byte aligned, you need to add some pad. So for example, if you're sending a U8, you gotta add three bytes of pad to make that four total. So RT Netlink uses a scheme where there's like four actions on objects. A new, a delete, a get, a set. Those basic operations are repeated for each one of the objects. And the objects are links, addresses, routes, neighbors, uh, rules, etc. So when you combine those two together, example message types are RTM new link, RTM del link, RTM new route, RTM get route, okay? So that's kind of the generic pattern. 
And then those four go together for that object. But you don't have to implement an action for an object type. So there's several messages where there's only a get, for example. So each object, as I showed earlier in that slide of the message format, each object has its own header struct. So for example, if I'm doing a link, it's an IF info message. And I have the struct there as an example. If I'm doing neighbors, it's an ND message struct. That is the theory. That's what's supposed to be happening for all these different message types. So if I'm sending a new link or a get link or a delete link, I have an IF info message in front. And then lastly, for some background, you know, Rupin mentioned also that you know, the kernel will generate notifications. So let's say process A inserts a new route into the kernel. The kernel generates a notification that goes up to user space for any other processes that are interested. They can also learn of that route that got added or deleted. Or if a link goes up or down, same thing. A, a notification is generated. User space gets to kind of follow along about what's, what's happening. Uh, because it's a 32-bit mask for the groups, remember if you're using any groups over bit 31, you have to use a set sock opt to join the membership of that group. And that actually comes up with the next hop stuff that I've done. I'm over 31, so my 32, so I have to start using uh, the set sock opt to join the, the, the group. Okay, with that background on the theory of Netlink and the message types and the parsing and such, let's get into some past mistakes and how that's hurting us going forward. So, way back in the beginning, IP Route 2 had this generic dump filter um, or, or dump function that it was using to, to send down to the kernel, to, you know, to generate the message, send to the kernel that says, give me all the links that, are, that you know about or give me all the routes that you know about. And that header that it put on the front of the message was just an RTGen message. RTGen message is just a family, okay? Had no other information. Well, that was really illegal for everything except namespaces, which didn't exist back when that originally was there. So really, when you're doing a link, a link dump, it should have been an IF info message. When you're doing a neighbor dump, it should have been an ND message, et cetera, for each one of those message types and each one of those headers I showed earlier in that summary, okay? So about, uh, I forget the dates now, around uh, 3.9, someone decides, hey, you know, I want to add a filter to my dump request. And so what they're really doing is they come in and they add an attribute. They add some data after that header that the kernel then parses and says, oh, not only am I going to do a, a, a dump of the links, I'm also going to modify this dump with the following request. And in this case, it was virtual functions. Give me all the virtual function information as well. So the developer goes into the code and changes that struct from RTGen message to IF info message. But that handler was used by all the dump requests. So suddenly, if I'm doing a neighbor dump, I'm pushing down an IF info message. If I'm doing an address dump, I'm pushing down an IF info message. That should have been illegal from the kernel's perspective. But the code that was originally put in allowed it. There was no checking on what came down from the user space. It said, oh, well, I'm doing a link dump. Let me just pass that off to whatever address family handles this and run through all the devices that are known and push back that request. And that, there's implications of that. Um, all right, so I think I've covered, I've covered all that. All right, so let's look at some examples. Someone else, and so the, the point of this, this kind of historical uh, trip here, it's not to point fingers, we're all human, we all make mistakes, we're all focused on what we want to get done. But really what I'm trying to get at with these examples is just to say when we overlook things in the past with this edict from Linus, from Linus about Linux is that thou shalt never break user space. So once you allow user space to do something, you have to forever allow user space to do something. And that, that over time, that kind of builds up this, this legacy that we have to deal with. So someone else comes along and says, you know, I want to modify this FDB dump request to only send me the entries for a specific bridge or a specific bridge port. And so IP Route 2, it's already sending the IF info message that was then copied into the FDB.C for IP Route 2, and we added the master attribute to the end of that. Kernel happily accepted it. All the other dump handlers weren't affected, so eh, hey, moving along, right? But 
all those other dump handlers were now being given a larger message than what should have been allowed. So then other people come along, me, and I do things like VRF. And you know, immediately I know if I'm dumping tables, I don't want to dump all the tables. I want to be able to say, just give me this one specific table. I'm only interested in route table 1001. So I go to add that to the kernel. Hey, let me tell the kernel, only give me the routes for 1001. I can't, because how can I add that attribute to the RT message header, and that kernel can uniquely identify that it's an RT message plus this table request, as opposed to an IF info message and that um, VF function uh, filter that was added to the end of it. You get into this problem now of the kernel cannot uniquely identify what the request is. So, can't do it. So then, this past fall, uh, someone else was adding other requests to kind of modify that dump handler. In this case, it was Christian wanting to say, hey, give me all the addresses that are known in some target namespace, okay? Sure, great idea. I want to modify what, what information is coming back from the kernel. But again, how does the kernel know uniquely what this request is? You need to be able to parse that message. So knowing that I had all these things in my head about I want to be able to, to do some other kernel side filtering, kind of stopped what I was doing at that time and went and added this um, strict checking infrastructure, which basically was trying to fix some of these past mistakes and say, let's add another API that says, I'm an updated user space. I'm sending you the proper header. Please do all the formal checking. Make sure I have the right structure. Make sure I have you know, request any, any bit that's in this, this dump request that it's a valid part of what this handler knows how to, how to um, interpret and then send back. But that's awkward. User space is basically opting in to the kernel doing the right thing when the kernel really should have been doing the right thing from the beginning. And so I guess the point here is just because of, I don't want to say shortcuts or whatever, just this hyper-focused development that happened in the past it's really impacted the ability to, move, to do something new in the future. And we have to create new APIs to handle that. Really awkward kind of a user space, um, you know, a API and interface for someone new comes along. So if someone new comes into Netlink and they want to write an application, what do you mean I have to opt in to, you know, rigid checking and actually being able to do something legit? And then of course, you know, I only have so much time so I changed all the things that were important to me. So routes, rules, neighbors, addresses, et cetera. I didn't have the time to get into TC. So now we have this user space API that affects most of Netlink, or Netlink route, but not all of Netlink route, right? So again, it's a little bit of uh, awkwardness going forward. But you know, again, I think things are much better now than they were. So going forward, Kernel developers, if you're writing new infrastructure like ETHtool over Netlink, <laughs> please use the, the strict check, uh, strict parsing functions, so the NL, NL message parse strict and NLA parse strict to val validate every single bit. Any new code should be required to check everything. The right header, the right bits in the header, if there's reserve fields that you don't modify your dump with, check those and say not valid if it's, if it's non-zero. And then use the strict, so I have a par policy, and then use these strict uh, parsing functions to validate what's coming down from user space. And so going forward, new code should have this rigid checking in place from the get-go. Kind of a, an extending piece of this, um, you know, incomplete checking from the past, the kernel has also allowed wrong attribute sizes. Yeah, there's a policy. Yeah, it does some validation that makes sure there's at least that many bytes. But at least is not the right API. If the API is a U32, it shouldn't be greater than equal to four bytes. It should be four bytes. And if user space sends more than that, it's wrong. An example of this, something I hit recently was, uh, you know, I'm adding IPv6 gateways for IPv4 routes. And I noticed that if, if I put an IPv6 address into the RTA gateway attribute and I send that to the IPv4 code, it ignores the top 12, uh, 12 bytes. 
So the, the, the route that gets inserted is wrong, top right? Top or bottom. Huh? And probably even top or bottom, depending on your machine engine. Yeah, exactly. And we're not even going to be a little Indian versus uh, big Indian interpretation of it. Yeah, this is strictly uh, the x86 that I'm working on. You know, I would do this, you know, I'm going and hack up IP route 2 to say, hey, what happens when I do this? And the route looks really weird because it's interpreting an IPv6 address as an IPv4. Are you going to blame the kernel for that? The user sent a bad uh, address. The kernel should not allow it. Assume user space is dumb, right. and the kernel well, should be doing strict checking, right? Uh, checking, yes, but I mean, if, it, if you give it uh, a bunch of octets, it looks at the length, it only assumes that the four bytes are good enough for v4. I, right. I, my argument is that an API is an API, and it should be exactly an API, not an ish, right? So saying that RTA gateway for IPv4 is four or more, right. and I'll pick which four bytes I want to acknowledge. That's not no, really I mean, a good API. Uh, okay, well, you may have to say, uh, define Indianness or something like that, but if you give me more data than I need, mm -hmm. sh uh, what should I do with the rest of the data? Or should, or should we say that this is invalid because I'm an IPv4 gateway? It should be invalid. Okay, fine. Yeah, that's what I mean by getting into strict checking and validating what user space is sending should be exactly what I expect. Not more, not less. So kind of in this same vein is also the new set commands. So for example, the handlers have historically not checked every attribute in a request. Okay, you're allowing some flexibility. But there are side effects to that. If you have new user space running on an older kernel, new user space is sending down an attribute that the old kernel doesn't understand. So it ignores it. But that's not what the user asked for. The user asked for a specific networking config, and the kernel's ignoring something it didn't understand. And an example of this is, uh, of course, I always have examples for this stuff. Um, Let's go forward, I think it's this next slide. Yeah, RTA via was an attribute that was added recently for MPLS, right? So MPLS, it wants to have a gateway that's either a v4 or a v6. So it's a new attribute that says, here's your RTA gateway or here's your gateway you know, um, value, but then I have to tell you the address family to interpret it, okay? Well, that's great, MPLS needed this. To RTA, that's a generic routing attribute. IPv4 and IPv6, we're not paying attention to that. They're ignoring that attribute completely. So if you send down a route that has an RTA via with IPv4, IPv6, the route you get is not the route you asked for. The gateway is completely ignored, and all you get is a device-only route. So again, th this has impacts on the kernel's not doing what the user asked. And one example that, that, that this, or not example, a, a limitation that this provides or, or in, uh, has is something like FRR can't probe for when a feature is supported, right? So really what the kernel should have been doing this whole time is saying, I've gone through all the attributes that are in this message. I don't support some of these. I'm going to return E and val. Now user space knows it's asking for something I can't okay. provide. So, so is, it, is it lunchtime or can I? Because I, I think we have okay. a few minutes. Okay. So my, my, my only challenge is this, you know, the principle of robustness, if you maybe attribute it to John Postel, be conservative what you expect of others and be liberal, sorry, is it be liberal what, what you expect of other people? If I send you crap that you don't support, you can ignore it. That, that's, if, but you don't send crap to other people. That's um, yes, I am familiar with the phrase and I don't know the exact line, but if the user space is telling you to do something and you're not doing it, then you're not doing what you were asked to do, right? So in the case of VXLAN being the example, I think it was discussed a few years ago, you know, attributes being completely ignored, it could be a, a security hole, right? In some cases, depending on what the attribute okay, is, so it could be a huge problem that you're just ignoring it. Uh, do, you, do you have like a next, another slide that we will say what your solution is or is this a discussion? Uh, yeah. the, the solution, yeah, I, I do bring that up generically. The solution is to, the, the, when you're doing kernel-side development, you should be checking everything. 
and you should be erring out if the user space sends you something you don't need, you don't support. And here's why. I know you I know you want the more liberal policy, but features are constantly coming in. Features are backported. Vendors, you know, vendor distributions are always backporting stuff. How does a generic application know it can use a certain feature on a certain kernel? Right, but how far uh, old kernels will ignore what you're sending? I'm sorry. A, a kernel from yeah, three years ago kernels. is not going to interpret what you sent. Right. Right. So, how do you become generic? Uh, Mike. Mike. That, that's not the issue, though, right? It's a compatibility problem. You you build something and you release it out there. You have to now figure out whether a kernel just ignored it or a kernel in implemented it and did what you expected which becomes an impossible task once you start getting to see the overlap of different attributes from different features. Uh, uh, as long as you, you're not going to use alt kernels, you're fine, right? No, but you might. So, so I, this is why I'm giving specific examples. So well, I'm just saying because you may have if this check that's telling me it's invalid. So this, this, this is why I, I bring up RTA via. So RTA via is needed for IPv6 gateways with IPv4 routes. This is an essential feature that right. all network operating systems have to have. Right. So I have that implemented now. How does FRR know when it can use it? How does an because, old kernel know about it? Because, like I said, if, if FRR is running on an old kernel and it right. pushes that down thinking, oh, I'm using unnumbered, I can just push this route down, and then the kernel drops the gateway completely, right. it doesn't work. Your networking is broken. Uh, That's I horrible. Understand. That's yeah. wrong. Uh, no, I, I, I totally agree with you. I'm just saying that there's no way, we have had no traditional way of indicating that if this thing I'm sending you doesn't work for you, I want you to, to tell me it's, it's bad if you can support this attribute. So I would argue that's part of proper API design. No, I, and I, with perf, for example, any bit yeah. that comes down in a perf event, it will error out. And so perf for a long time has had this ability to kind of figure out based on the order features were added, and it will probe in the reverse order and say, oh, you don't support this, 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 and this. I'm going to go with this working config to get the perf events. Yes. Networking should be doing something similar. If you just ignore the things you don't understand, you have, then well, some that, user space has but no I'm idea saying that's, what's that's going a, on. That's a long-standing principle. I mean, XML does the same thing. You can name like 10 different things that says, ignore right. what you don't understand. Error, prob you, should error, you should log it, probably. You should always error out, is my argument. It's, that's too conservative. Right. I, I mean, mean th th I would are, argue that's there, unacceptable for a networking to be ignored. Networking no, configuration. I, I, I think there, there I, are other alternatives, right? I right. mean, people have done this with things like OpenGL, where you basically have extension attributes, and you negotiate, which is along the lines of what you described for perf. You negotiate yeah. up front, and you only use the attributes that you are allowed to use. And if you call something that you're not allowed, it becomes an explicit error call. But Retroactively fitting that into, t into Netlink may not be the easiest. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's the problem. I mean, if you're saying you're going forward, I'm sorry, I, I, I just want to make this one point. Going forward, maybe, and I think SCTP does this, you, you will set a bit, correct me if I'm wrong, which, uh, which says, I can't operate if you can't set this attribute. Right? You send it to the kernel. Mm -hmm. And yeah, if you don't set that bit, then it'll be ignored. It's fair to ignore it. Or in other words, and if you set that flag, then, then yeah, it makes sense to ignore. But I don't, th I don't know how you can do backward compatibility with that. that was, right. That was a common thing. Yeah. So for the RTA yeah. via, I did send out patches, which now IPv4 and IPv6 will error out. But it's going to take time. And so FRR for the longest time will have no way of knowing, can I use this feature or not? Uh, and I'm saying that this exact feature, the MPLS feature you pointed out, would fail in old kernels, and our FRR wouldn't know anything about it. It's it would fail. Huh? It's not failing. It's yeah, misinterpreted. Yeah, it, it, it will be accepted. FRR will use the wrong uh, uh, field. Uh, so it won't uh -huh. have the correct. Uh, FRR is sending the right message. It's sending the, the right message. The kernel is ignoring. It gets a success, because partial, but partially the gateway was, in, was installed. Right. So you're trying to get BGP unnumbered working, and it won't. And the user's like, wait a minute. Well, if you use kernel 2.3.2 uh, or 2.6.3.2. It won't work, correct? Yeah. It will still be. The attributes are very old, right? They always worked. <laughs> huh? yeah. I recently fixed it. It'll make its way through all the back, stable backports. But that takes time. And uh, really, it's the bigger point of, and I use this example from both the missing attribute and the ability to probe. This is an essential feature that 
a legit user space application has no way of knowing when can it use it, when can it not. Right. And that's horrible. That's a horrible API. Yeah, I, I just wanted to point out that in this example, you, could, you can see something really bad because the request does not error. The request is not ignored. It's actually inter misinterpreted because only part of the request is ignored. I, I'm clearly just imagine that uh, you want to add a net filter rule with IP tables and uh, kernel doesn't understand one of the conditions. So it just omits it. No, so so I'm, I'm saying there's nothing wrong with that based on the current philosophy. We've, we've always had this philosophy of being liberal. You, know, you send me crap and say, okay, well, he's crazy. I'm mm -hmm. just going to ignore him, right? But in this case, it's not crap. It, w it was not crap. So, but given all the kernels up to this point have been behaving this uh, way. So the VXLAN, when right. VXLAN first came on, uh, this, uh, there was a discussion years ago about this um, ignoring attributes you don't understand and how you get the completely wrong networking fig. And it's like, how do you fix this going forward? Well, I would argue anyone who puts in a new API in the kernel should have this rigid checking so that user space can reliably know if it can use an attribute or not. Because otherwise, it's a crapshoot on what it, you're really getting. It's a middle ground like the SCTP model where I, I think it's SCTP. Sets, I, as a user, will tell you. Like FRR will now set a flag to say, by the way, it's very bad if you can't apply this attribute. And then you get an error on Sure, that, that gets into what I put in for this Rick checking, which is basically saying, I have a clue. I'm sending you that information. Okay, so, so you have Please that interpret kind of, it. But I think yeah. that's an awkward API. I think that's horrible to say. I think the, it should be the inverse of be relaxed. You know, if you don't understand something, it's okay to ignore it. That's it. Okay, so, so as long as that flag is there, I'm with you. It, we're in the middle somewhere. We're not there. too conservative, Forget, we're not too liberal. For new and sets, it's not there, right? And so I guess what I'm arguing is we're, we're in a horrible situation where user space has no way of knowing how something's going to be interpreted. And I would say that's un, unacceptable going forward. And so that's what this kind of slide gets into is when you have all this lax checking, you have this history, you end up with these really ugly hacks. And the strict checking is just one. I could have given many more examples where some ugly API additions have been put in to accommodate these past mistakes. And for us to have, you know, for, for example, one of the things Donald's been asking for FRR is, you know, if, if there's no way to get an error back when it doesn't support something, then how do I know what's supported? There, there's got to be something that says, tell me what you'll interpret. Right, um, and then I guess uh, as a part of this request, it's also it, this this edict where you can't change, you can't break user space. When something is coming in for new user API, we got to be very careful and thoughtful about you know everyone needs to put some eyes on it and review it and give some ideas or of whether this is a good thing or a bad thing because once it goes in, it's yeah. done. So on that, I think the problem is. There's not enough time. I think uh, Yir is here. <laughs> Yir. Yeah. We've always complained about, hey, let UAPI discussions stay there for a long time, right? Sure. Because it's too late once you. We've had this discussion. We, we a few have times, had this yes? discussion again, and that's why it's like bring it up again. Yeah, I actually tried to ask Dave yeah. Miller to do that multiple times. If, if there's a UAPI in that pull request, yeah. <laughs> just leave it there for the two weeks. <laughs> That's all right. You can wait. But you know, it's not like that, unfortunately. I don't see how to force it. <laughs> well, that's where yeah, it, Dave's trying to balance a lot of things. And so this is where the community has to be involved as well. And e even if it has been a week after they've been applied, until it hits Linus's tree and actually gets released from there, there is a chance to either fix it or revert it. So. There, there is some time window, but we all have to be involved and invested in, in doing that and doing the review. And yeah, I think. And this I, is a request also for kernel side developers to start doing the strict checking, start doing the. Yeah, so, like my next op API, I do run that through that list. If there's an attribute that comes down, it's going to error out. And that's because I want that. I want networking demons to be able to say, you know, you don't but, support this. But isn't that something we really need to go and. Um, sort of make the make some kind of generic infrastructure for so that you don't have to go check every single attribute. Um, but it's going to be, so it's this gets into what Jamal said with the liberal thing, right? maybe some areas are okay with ignoring it. 
Um, for me, the next hop stop, no. It, it, every single attribute needs to come down. I need to understand it. I need to know I'm doing the right thing with that request from user space. And I, and I would argue that's, for most networking config, that's always going to be true. It should always run through the TBIs, the, you know, the, the attributes, and say, if I don't understand this one, I've got to tell the user I don't understand this. Ignoring should never be acceptable, I guess is the summary. All right, it looks like we're out of time for this uh, initial 30 minutes. Uh, any other quick questions? Are you done? No, I've got the scale piece of this, but that's a whole so, other. So lunch is, lunch is upstairs. I'll okay. take coffee. So next on the agenda is discussions on uh, scale, so NetLink messaging at scale. Um, I want to start with, uh, I guess, some suggestions for application developers. So if you're doing something with NetLink and you're like, how can I make things better? So if you remember back in one of those original slides, first slides for me, um, I showed that format for NetLink messages, which is the null message header followed by the payload. Well, the NetLink API supports batching. So you can push down a buffer with multiple messages in it and the kernel loops over each one of those messages calling the handlers to, to do whatever you're asking for that particular message. So that is one way to get, uh, to get increased scale. So TC batch, for example, was recently changed to use this. And FRR, for example, I'm told is working on support for this. Another option is to not set the act flag for every message. So don't have the kernel send you back up. That everything was good, everything was good everything was good. And instead, only get back an error, an error message. So if you push down a command that the kernel said, mm, I can't do this for you, then you get an, an error message back. And so you can say, well, everything else must have worked fine. Although based on that last discussion, perhaps assumptions aren't a good thing. So anyway, uh, FRR recently did this, switched to not getting an act for every message. And it was a ballpark about a 20% improvement. Um, one problem that we do have to start thinking about and dealing with is notification storms. So as I mentioned uh, in the beginning of this, um, typically there's a multicast group that applications can register with to get notifications as events happen in the kernel. Unfortunately, there are way too many events and the messages that are generated are way too large. So link events are the huge example of this in terms of both message size and in frequency. Uh, so when all these messages get generated and the applications that have asked for these notifications, their sockets can overflow pretty quickly if they're not able to run and handle the messages in time. And if the application overflows, typically the application is going to close the socket and start over again, which is a resync, and that can be extremely costly if you have to do an entire dump to kind of reset where you are. So. You know, I mentioned in the last slide that NetLink supports batching with respect to messages. So an application can push down a buffer with a whole bunch of messages. Is it possible to do something like batched notifications? So can we have a whole bunch of notifications get generated in one buffer and then push those up to user space and have it apply? I haven't looked into this. It was one of the suggestions that was tossed on the mailing list, for example. Um, when it, when it comes to generating these notifications, it takes a noticeable amount of time to allocate the SKB, to fill in the information for that object type, link being the largest one of those, and then to have that message um, applied to all the sockets. If there are no listeners, could we potentially bypass generating that message completely? Or based on whatever filtering is in place, based on like what Jamal will talk about a little bit later, is it possible to somehow know ahead of time, eh, no one cares about this message, right? So that could end up saving a significant amount of time on the kernel side, generating something that no one cares about. And so those are more open questions. Um, one option that does exist today is for applications to push down a BPF filter to an L-Link socket. But unfortunately, that applies after the SKB has been generated. So. In this case, you know, all the applications will get a copy, you'll run the filter on it, and just this app says, eh, I don't care about this message. Okay, sure, that's a, it's a, it's a help. Some notes on applications won't be waking up for all the messages, but there's gonna be, you know, there are limits to what you can do with those BPF filters. 
one example for this is VRF. So VRF is more of a, it's a higher level feature. So for example, if link one has an event, I mean ETH one has a link event, and ETH one is not in the VRF of interest, how does an application say, I only care about management verf events? So in which case, ETH one's not a part of management verf, I don't want to no be notified about this. What can we do in, in, in that scope? So as I said, you know, link events are by far the, the largest message sizes and frequency of, of notifications. Routes is another one, so when a link goes down, um, IPv4 does not generate notifications to user space. It's, the user space is expected to monitor those link events and say, oh, I know the kernel just evicted all the routes associated with this device. IPv6 does not. I sent a patch in, I don't know how, how long ago now, maybe six months ago, where you can opt in, have v6 opt into this behavior where a, a link goes down, and so IPv6 routes that are evicted because of that link down event do not generate a notification. So that is one way to kind of help reduce this storm. MPLS is kind of all over the board. <laughs> Need, need to find some time to focus on that one and bring it in line with the other routing, routing uh, families. Neighbors, same thing. And you get into scenarios like eVPN where you can have tens of thousands of Macs per, per device. If your device goes down, that's a whole bunch of notifications that have to get generated to user space. Um, I have a version, multiple versions of a neighbor patch that says, again, you can opt in to user space doesn't need to be told about all these events. It's already monitoring link events. It already knows all the stuff is gonna happen. It'll evict it from their cache on its own. You don't need to generate these events. So just a comment on that. So TC also does some of this stuff. When you have a hierarchy of, thing, of objects, and if the root is gone, you don't wanna advertise the lower level. So I think the link going down, meaning routes which were tied to that link, there's no point in advertising whoever, assumedly whoever's doing it in user space already knows the hierarchies in. If the link is gone, the routes. Well, it's gone. it's not just the application that does it; it's the other ones. So I've got some examples. I think it's on the next slide. Um, so does TC today generate those notifications? And you're well, saying a patch example, is needed to opt out? For example, if I could add a QDisk ingress, add filters to it. Mm -hmm. If I delete the QDisk ingress, which is the mother of the filters, mm -hmm. I don't get notifications that filters were deleted. I get notification that QDisk was deleted. Okay. And then I deduce that okay, the filters are gone as well. Okay. So let's look at examples of <laughs> applications that are notified. So you'd be surprised, and this comes out of some testing that Donald's done with FRR, where you inject a million routes into the kernel and you're watching the CPU, kind of surprising. NTP, taking a lot of CPU. DHCPD, taking a lot of CPU. Turns out both those processes register for notifications every time you have a link event, every time you have an address event, a routing event, a multicast routing event, when you get into a, a networking operating system environment, there can be millions of routes, tens of thousands of, of links and addresses. So NTPD is waking up and doing a lot. Well, what is it doing? Well, really all it's doing is receiving this message, says, oh, I should reset this timer value. And so it sets a flag to not do anything for n number of seconds. That's a lot of overhead just to say, I'm gonna wait a few seconds before I check something. So what can we do to reduce that, that overhead? And one example I said is, is management verf. If I'm running NTPD and management verf, then it shouldn't know anything about the data plane events. It really should only know about management verf events. So what can we do to have some kind of a filtering and limitation that, you know, that, that again says NTP would only be notified of these? Um, DHCPD, same thing. It was doing much more processing. It registered for all these notifications. And it was actually, as Donald was saying, it was a sorted link list for inserting these routes, for example. And just a small change in the code made a huge change in how much CPU it was doing. Didn't really get into analyzing what it's doing with those routes or addresses or links. But point being is that you've got multiple demons, sometimes surprising demons, that are listening to all these notifications from the kernel. And I think Jamal has some other examples later based on what he wants to do with filtering. Uh, the next topic gets into um, querying the kernel. 
So if you think of the kernel, you know, if, you, if you buy into the Linux model where the kernel is your source of networking truth, you've got FRR that takes care of route management and it puts routes into the kernel. You've got IF up down to or whatever interface manager. It's responsible for creating links, putting addresses on it. And then some other process, maybe it's a monitoring daemon, wants to learn about these things. You know, it can issue these uh, get requests with the dump flag set, and so it gets everything. Or maybe only wants some subset. Maybe this is a user trying to figure out where something went, went wrong. And what you don't want to do is have this database in the kernel with like a million routes or 10,000 links and push all that data up to user space when it only cares about, say, ETH1, right? So that's a lot of wasted cycles, both on the kernel side, pushing all this data to user space, and the user space going, I don't care about this one, right? And if that, that dump gets interrupted, you get started all over again. Um, so one thing that we can do at this, at, you know, for, for the dump requests, is to put some filtering. So for example, we, you know, I label this as course filtering for get requests, which is, you know, if you remember back in that first slide about uh, Netlink messages, <laughs> which is a header with a payload, and the, the header has some attributes after it. So for a GET request, normally you don't have any data after it. But what if we started putting attributes behind it? So for example, when I did VRF, you know, I, I knew I, wasn't, I didn't want to dump everything about the route table or everything about the neighbor table. So I added an attribute to the end of that um, neighbor dump request that said, only tell me things associated with this master device or the VRF device, right? So now I'm only getting neighbor entries associated with the birth of my interest. So that is one way to take this huge database and limit it down to a smaller subset of things the user cares about. And there's been some other attributes that have been added as well. So for example, with that strict checking, I was able to do things like um, if you're doing an address dump on an interface, you know, the old way is you basically had to do an address dump of everything and then come back and display to the user just the interface in question. But now you can say, only tell me the interface information for this one interface, right? So you've gone from dumping everything to just dumping the addresses on the interface in question, right? And so again, this is what I call the, the coarse grained filtering and it's gonna be a little bit different than what, uh, than what Jamal wants to get into with the fine grained filtering. I think that was it. So any, I guess I didn't really get into it from a time perspective. I guess I should have summarized um, for the different message types within RT Netlink, what are the course filtering options that exist? Because you really have to be a kernel developer going into the code to say, ah, for neighbors, I can specify a device of interest and a master device of interest. For FDB, I can specify a bridge port of interest and a master device of interest, or you know, the bridge of interest. Um, I guess I should create a summary of that that says, today, this is what you can do from a coarse grain filtering perspective. So any, any questions? All right, I think uh, Jamal is next, moving into a lower level filtering I was suckered by Solmini to give this talk. <laughs> she did most of the work, okay? <laughs> so, uh, I need to speak. Right, so we want slightly fine-grained uh, event notification. So we, we have a gazillion of events we receive. I don't know if somebody saw that. I gave a little talk earlier on, on TCP, how we collect a lot of TCP uh, netlink info. Uh, but there's a lot of, uh, for, for actions, for example, we have a million actions in the kernel running at any one time, right? And they're being actively updated or deleted. We could change different attributes of those. And so we receive this event. So what, some of the things we do is we create a sharding of these Netlink sockets by creating multiple sockets. Each one of them supposedly listens to, to one event. Uh, so th that's one way to scale, is you can add 
uh, filters per socket and have every socket responsible for one feature. In any case, so here are some of the things that uh, uh, some, of, some of them apply to Somini's case, some to ours. For example, the IFA info message, the IFA, is it IFA info? Uh, when, when I add an address or delete an address, I get the whole thing, whether I like it or not. But what if I could add a filter into the kernel and say, only tell me if address 1234 prefix 32 chain, uh, got deleted. That's it, that's all I wanna know, and if only it happens on I, uh, IF index one. Another one is, uh, I only want to see link change events. When the link goes down, in other words, the no carrier flag is set. I don't wanna hear anything else. I know that you do admin down up, you may add a port, you may add delete, they all come with the same RT new link or RT deleted del link. I don't want to hear, because at that level of filtering I can. I can subscribe to the net link broadcast pass and say, I put my hook in there, just give me all RTM new links, and I receive everything unconditionally, right? Another thing is um, the negation of that, right? Tell me when anything else goes down but IF index two. Right, that's another uh, uh, fine grained filter. Another one is just tell me when the neighbor changes, don't tell me about new link unless it's, a new neighbor, I'm sorry, unless it's uh, the following address. You can also put some thresholds, right? What if I wanna say, only tell me when Rx bytes cross, for, for this IF index cross 10,000 bytes, right? Er or errors hit 500. Or if you want to be more creative, for you get an error rate at one per second. Those are very fine-grained events, uh, filtering, right? There's no way to currently express them. Uh, same thing with get requests, other than, than dump. I wanna be able to say the same thing, but what if I wanna be more creative? Think of, uh, to, to be honest, the, what we have in the kernel is a database, right? So think of this as a select, you're doing a get, get, uh, database select request. Look up the FDB and tell me where port equals to is zero and this address is reachable or something to that effect. Or, when the, uh, or add another select parameter. Or you can do metaconditional things like, you know, like I need to know if the stats changed in the last one minute. Don't tell me any other time. I'm gonna do a get and you only give it back to me if it changed in the last one minute. So, uh, Uh -huh. have, uh, so someone is speaking. Uh, so the FTP right. get. Right. We recently added a handler for that. Okay. But it doesn't have qualifiers like reachable or anything. It just looks up the FTP given a MAC address and uh, device. No. So I I think that's the that's a point I want to talk about because uh, I, are those filters sufficient? Because now you have changed the kernel, and you've changed user space that has to know about this. Right? Mm -hmm. It's good, that's the way we've been doing things so far. Um, uh, what, I, I'll get to that point actually, it's one of my bullets, my, my slides here. So what we've done so far, we've used classical BPF, right? You, put, you write your assembler code, you know uh, where things are, you've got an SKB serialized already. Uh, yeah, you can, you, can, you can check and drop as long as it's a single message and you didn't receive a whole big dump and you wanna drop something in the middle, right? Then it becomes a challenge. Uh, as long as it's not, uh, you, and even dumps sometimes you can actually deal with them, but you, when you have something that's nested, TLVs, which may require to write some sort of conditions in classical BPF that looks like you're iterating a loop, it's not very good at doing that kind of stuff. Uh, TC actions are an example. Um, so ju just to let you know that every TC action comes on exactly the same, it, it's also RTM new action. You have to look at the kind attribute and you'll say, oh yeah, it's, it's a myriad. I'm not interested in myriads or I'm interested in myriads only. And if you're dumping uh, one million entries and you're only interested in range one to five. So we've been adding hacks like that where I can pass the ranges. Now it's another filter. I've changed user space, I've changed the kernel. Right. Uh, yeah, so the classical example is what you just described, and I use David's uh, example here where he added the table ID. Um, and yes, it's a nice filter, and it was not needed before, but it was needed now because of scale, right? So 
I think that was a motivation for adding it at the time. You just wanted just the one table. Well, the original That's motivation was when I was doing VRF. Right. <laughs> okay. I, I didn't want all the tables. I just right. wanted the VRF table. Right. And I knew from history, you know, like I'd gone into about the IF info message header struct being sent, that I couldn't just go in and set the table ID in the dump request. I knew something much more was needed. So mm -hmm. that, that was the motivation for doing that was from 2015. I just didn't have the infrastructure in place to actually make it happen. Right, right. But again, I put this in the the high level. You don't want to have a gazillion if checks on every message or every object that you're pushing out. You really want to have this like high level filtering, and then, you know, f from the aspect of sending more attributes in, um, only take it from a huge set of data to a smaller set of data, as opposed to what you're trying to go after, which is just specific data. Yeah, when you have a gazillion of these things, you yeah. really don't want to get all of them and then filter in user space, which is what IPR2 does, right? It dumps all the ports and says, oh, yeah, it's, it's zero, and get me IF index for that guy. I've made a few changes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, you're, you're right. It does require the kernel side support for that. And right. IPR2 falls back to what it does in the past, which is it gets everything and then has the filter that says, oh, the user didn't care about this, this, and this but it's a lot of wasted cycles all the way around. Yes. So yeah. if this is for dumps, though, Mike. When, yeah. if this is for dumps, though, even if you do a socket filter, it's post forming the message. So we've right? gotten lucky over the time. The filtering that David added is more optimal Yeah, it, uh, no, no, I'm saying that's, that's better than the classical BPF, but it requires for me to go and change the kernel code. Mm -hmm. I can support, it's not backward compatible. And it requires for me to change the user space code that knows how to set these attributes, right? With classical BPF, sure. if I can get away with it, I just write a small filter that I put in the socket and it filters for me, right? The, I think the one that we use the most is to look at the kind field and drop when we're scaling yeah. the actions. Sure, but it's always post creating all dump, basically the kernel dumps the whole table, right. then at the socket you're going to filter. So it, imagine right? I have so a million entries. I'm only, I was only interested in four one. of them. <laughs> And it's a loop, right? And it's, the mes messages are partial, so it's whatever fills up the socket. I have to filter that, and I have to maintain current of state. Oh, yeah, there's more coming. Look at yeah. the end, right? Until I say NL message done, I know it's not over yet. And try to do NL message done in net. I think, you, yeah, with classical BPF, it's not a problem. NL message done is a message type in an NL message header, so. OK, so the goal was, OK, this is uh, the patches that came from uh, so many at the time, and say, okay, can we do something in the middle, right? Uh, could we do uh, what, what we call the hybrid mode? So our goal is to have no kernel changes. Can we add this select, quote unquote, features without making any kernel changes? So in the future, I want to do something that I'm only interested in. I don't want to push it to the kernel, because it makes no sense if I want to filter based on some crazy attribute that nobody else is interested in. Uh, could we, so, so that's, that's what our goal was, right? Can we put a generic enough description in the get request so that when it iterates the table, the dump, uh, when it's dumping, it's gonna be able to run my, execute my select message, if you wanna call it that, and not, uh, and I don't have to change the kernel. That, that, that is the ultimate goal if we can get away with it. So, so me introduced this patch in that archive, that's what started our discussion at the time. But again, it, it's, it, it, it kind of worked, am I correct? It kind of worked, and, uh, but it was horrible. It's like you have to deal with memory management, you have to pick, put a little point over here, oh yeah, shit, let, let me go backwards a little bit. It, it, was, it worked, but it's not something to, uh, you know, to try and push into the kernel, right? But it started a discussion, that's why we're here today, right? So there's a horrible SKB manipulation games. Uh, and it doesn't play well with events because again, the events could be across many, many messages, right? Um, so the idea of that you have to serialize the data structure into an SK into something that's is a stream, and then you have to poke into the stream and know where everything is, and then decide you want to drop half of that stream, but the other continues to work just as well as before. While doable, it's a little bit of acrobatics, right? So these are some numbers to. It's just a selling point I, uh, to show that, look, there is value in this. This experiment was run by, by so many. It shows that she had 200,000 uh, 
B, uh, FDBs in there. There's some crazy stuff that is going on. And she just want, uh, and she was able to reduce the call, the system calls going into the kernel by pushing the filter in this hybrid mode, by sending the get and doing a, a, a filter along with it, that was class was classical BPF, from 364 system calls to two, right? So you, it doesn't quite show in the number of CPU cycles there, but you, you know you got you went from 364 messages to two, right? So. Uh, but of course, you can't ignore the when you want to do non-trivial stuff. CBBF just doesn't cut it. Okay. So uh, here's a suggestion that kind of came up in that email discussion, right? What if we could make the fill info? Everybody has a fill info when they want to generate an event or they want to generate uh, uh, a dump. They call fill info, which builds your headers, and then it, you send it messages, and it keeps creating the, the SKB stream for you. What if we could put an eBPF hook there? I, I'm, I'm an eBPF fanboy as well. So, uh, and then this eBPF uh, callback would invoke your mm -hmm. own propriety um, eBPF code that you passed in a GET request, for example. Right, then, you, then the, the callback will say, call the BPF code, just like what uh, the TCP eBPF does. And it gets a return code which says, yeah, yeah, this, this, guy, this message is good. You can append it to the SKB. So, so that's the uh, um, general suggestions. Of course, this, there's a lot of uh, issues with this because now I have to, we have to go and inspect every spot where fill info is being invoked. Maybe we need a callback uh, and in some sort of ops structure there that now is going to call if the user has um, a, a BPF program along with a get, then it will be invoked and it returns something and then you, co you either continue depending on what the results are, right? So this is the kind of trick that TCP eBPF does and it has worked very well for them, right? You, you get messages and you can choose to do something about them or, or just return a code and say continue, right? Uh, well, this is just backup slide. There's nothing. That's it for me. So, so to, to get into, I guess, the details, and I think I mentioned this to you was it yesterday. I've lost track of time. Right. Um, one of the problems with doing eBPF, eBPF processing on, like, the fill infos, you don't have a single data structure that you can operate on. So it's not like you can say, here's a signature for your context, right? Because you're pulling information from all over the place. For example, you're pulling information out of the device structure. You're pulling yes. information out of FIP structures. You're pulling information out of neighbor structures. And in some cases, and I, I got brought up the management verb, right. maybe I want even derived information. So like, again, I only want information, only, this process only wants information related to management verb, which then that's a master device so property of a device. I think that if, we, if this is a, a good idea, if people agree it's a good idea, then they, we will have to write what one would call eBPF helpers. There'll be these structures will be visible to eBPF. All well, the IF info, IFA. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, but it's my argument is that it's not just the the hooks and the helpers that have to go in. You've got to create the data structure itself that the BPF code operates on. That, that's right. So I'm saying it's, it's equivalent to the, the fake SKB that eBPF has access to. Mm -hmm. Copies fields from the SKB. You'll need one for the link, for the route, for everything. Yeah under the Netlink wall, right? Yeah. You'll need one like that. Well, and then there's two different classes of problems here. One is the get request where you're, you send a request into the kernel asking for something, and the other one is the notifications. Yeah, the notifications right? are and kind that's of... that's a much harder problem because it's not directly connected to a process. That you're, you're correct about that. So it will have to be, because, they, and there may be a thousand u users trying to listen to the same event, and you'll have to deal with all of them. For, uh, how, uh, it, the get one is, it's easy to see. You have to fill all the fill info. Sure. Events also use fill info, right? The question is which of these filters do you use, right? Do you use uh, the filter that was incited by one user or another? I think there may be a way where this uh, eBPF code could be inserted in, in, in place or somewhere close to where the classical BPF code is invoked right now. You, you set it and you put it there, and then it gets invoked at, uh, when event fill info is being yeah, this, the classical code. BPF is run when it's getting attached to the socket as right. opposed to right. so uh, I, I, I before generation 
of the SKB. Right. So yes, it has to work on the on the, on the data structures, and it requires a lot of work, a lot of mechanical work. I would mm -hmm. say once the first one is done, I think the rest of them you can just copy verbatim. And of course, there's maintenance involved afterwards. What if a new field gets added that now you have to update eBPF? Um, so you which need I would some defeat helpers. your argument, which is needing kernel side changes as well as user space changes. Right, but uh, in this case, the kernel side changes are probably done once, in theory, unless you change the data structure. Mm -hmm. You don't have to add an IF index into this new IF info message that used to be zero, now you're setting it to mean something. That, that is, the structure existed already. It just, now the messaging has changed, right? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly you know, an intriguing need to, to be able to say, I, you know, like querying a database, I, I only want specific information. And right. to be able to do not hard-coded specific information requests. So to us, this is a big pain point, right? We have a, a lot of, uh, someone with a few hundred messages may not care, but we care about scale. Uh, so that's why this is important. Uh, now, there may be other ideas. This is eBPF. I, don't, I still have three minutes. Anybody else who <laughs> has a different way of solving this problem? I'll be happy to. Anybody wants to run Lua in the kernel? Anyone have any other suggestions for kind of filtering that's needed? Kind of add on to this, this need. Right. Well, I, I, anybody else thinks this is a useful problem to solve? Is anyone else awake? Uh, or? <laughs> well, <laughs> Florian says it's, it's a good problem. Then. Okay. Uh, all right. So I have two minutes. I can still take. I can take questions, or you can go to your backup slide. Uh, tomato. You're not allowed <laughs> to throw tomatoes. You can just say nice things to me. That's it. Okay. That's. I'm all right. Done. Thanks. Thank Thanks, Shabal. Jerry. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'm going to tell you something about Devlink Netlink, Netlink issues. Uh, it turns out that a lot of uh, these issues are uh, overlapping with the issues which are which were described already. Uh, how does this work? But green yeah, green top green. Yeah. Ah, okay, too big to see actually. Okay, so what is DevLink? I will just uh, tell you something about it. Of how many of you uh, raise your hand if you know what DevLink is? Okay, all right. So uh, basically, uh, uh, it was introduced to uh, model the ASICs in more accurate way. So uh, uh, in, in typical NIC, you have uh, one port and you have ETH zero for that. That's like the uh, standard model. But uh, there are NICs which have more ports, uh, but it is uh, one single ASIC. So in that case, it doesn't really make sense. And this is one of the examples. Uh, if you want to flash firmware on this ASIC, you have uh, two net devices, and you, you basically you used ETH2 minus F for one of those net devices. It's kind of weird, because when you flash one of, the, one of the net devices, you are actually flashing both, because it's single ASIC. So uh, for, that, for, this, for that purpose, and for a lot of other similar purposes, uh, it was uh, Devlink introduced to, to model the entity of the whole ASIC, and uh, then you have uh, another entities there, like objects, which one of those is Devlink port, uh, which handles physical or internal port of the ASIC. By internal, I mean if you have uh, like SROV, eSwitch, uh, it has uh, for each virtual function, you have one port of uh, embedded switch. And uh, so uh, Devlink uses uh, generic netlink, now we have about uh, 38 uh, do it commands. Uh, you can you can see it uh, in the in the in the code. Basically, it's uh, what it does is like most of those commands are for uh, working with the ports, 
setting some parameters, working with chair buffer, uh, vpipe, and uh, recently there was a health mechanism uh, introduced as well. There is a presentation about health, uh, I think tomorrow. I would recommend that. Uh, we have 12, uh, 12 of those commands support dump it, so you actually can dump the whole database. And I will talk, talk a little bit more about dump it uh, later on. So, uh, so here's something which uh, was kind of inherited from uh, the previous implementation of Netlink. Uh, there is no one-to-one -one mapping between comments and notifications, although it's somehow related. So, for example, notifications are named uh, C has the word CMD in them because they are kind of related with the command which it, it, it generated the notification. But also there might be, there, there are some notifications which are not generated by a command. For example, if a port appears in the system, it is not generated by any command, but still the notification uh, enum uh, has CMD in that. So it's kind of confusing. Uh, it's, it's, it's like, it works like that in most of the Netlink uh, APIs. It's, I, it's confusing. So I'm, I'm, just, I'm just throwing it in to, uh, to name it out. <laughs> Maybe for, for, the, for the future API we can do it better. But I think it's uh, mostly uh, because, as David described before, uh, ne uh, mes uh, messages types like new get, so th it's probably because of that. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, uh, the underscore new uh, command. You get that when you uh, you get that by, uh, the notification by that name you get when th the object is created and also when it is updated. And in user space, you really no, have no way to tell which event happened. So it's not really good, <laughs> probably. I think, to add, I think you should add a flag or something. Yep. Uh, maybe. The reason same messages is uh, generated is because an application might not listen to the create might. message. Might. Might. Oh. The application might. Have not be listening to the create message, right? It started a sock, created a socket later, and it just yeah. gets the new message. So I think yeah. a flag is possibly, probably the only option. Maybe, but where you put the flag, it's another attribute. I don't know. <laughs> the header, we don't have any more Maybe. space. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah it's it's solvable. It's it's just not sure how, and uh, yeah. And the last thing on the slide, uh, I put. It's, if you look at these issues, uh, the Netlink interface is too much flexible, so it allows people who are implementing API using it to do mess, basically. So maybe it would be good to have like tighter model to tie the commands and notifications together somehow <laughs> when you define the interface. But it's too late for that, I know, but yeah. But putting that into the lessons learned and things you do better going yeah. forward. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> nested attributes, it's, it's uh, in DevLink, in DevLink we have uh, all the attributes which are used by, by DevLink, it, it's one big enum. So the question is, do we want to have it in one big enum, or do we want to have separate enums for mm, for for separate nests? Uh, I I think that wireless guys are doing it in the same way. Uh, other Netlink uh, implementations are, are do are having a separate enum for for each. It's kind of confusing as well. Uh, well, you you, net, you, you, you are doing nesti uh, nesting, but you are using one uh, namespace of attributes, basically. The top level is just a single yeah, namespace. You, you just, it's just numbers, right? The attributes yeah. are just numbers. So you are using, you, are, you either have multiple enums, 
And for each nest, you have for separate enum. Separate enum, yes. Or like, like what we do in DevLink, you have one big enum for all. It's, it's good that the same attribute, which you, if you use it in multiple messages or multiple nests, you yeah. can use the same. <laughs> so that, yeah. that, that's pro. But con is, it's kind of messy to have everything the outer loop one, is, one yeah. enum. So, not sure. It, it, it's it's another thing when the flexibility it's kind of not good because it, get, get, it, it if you if you are used to 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 do something in one subsystem and you go to other one you are lost. Yeah, you're lost. Yeah. So, so I think nesting uh, RT netting usually nests better, right? I mean, in yeah, most it, cases. The, the arms are separated yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. Most, most of the time. And in some cases, duplicated. Because of that, yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. Another thing I wanted to talk about is the SKB spillage. I call it SKB spillage. So basically, uh, you have like two columns. Uh, the, the each rectangle represents a SKB, and each uh, green rectangle uh, represents uh, one attribute. So you can see it's uh, the nice thing. It goes a uh, level on, the, on each. Row got, gets uh, another nest, and then it goes back. So the problem is that um, the nest has to be ended in by the SKB. So it cannot, you cannot open a nest and finish the SKB, go to another SKB, and then to close the nest there. And so if you have like big dumps and which cannot fill into one SKB, you have to somehow resolve it. So what we did in in uh, in F, 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 a message, it's formatted message or some something like that in DevLink, we just introduced custom attributes to actually do this kind of ne nesting. It's uh, it's custom nesting basically. Uh, so I think Jamal's got a comment on that. Yeah, I mean, maybe you shouldn't send that message. <laughs> if you don't have enough socket buffer, is that what the problem is? You're fragmenting it now. No. Yeah. No, the SK, SKB is like four K SKB. You cannot okay. put all the data into one 4K SKB. Right, shouldn't you then just make it 8K or 16K? Well, yeah. But, but right. even at 64, I, I swear there was somebody recently that was saying I can't fit it all into one, into one message. Bec because, because Netlink is a messaging, right? It mes has message boundaries. It's not really streaming like the way TCP would, where you know, right. okay, yeah, I'm still waiting. Maybe it will show Yeah, up. but why not? I mean, you can have like very big dump, which, which you want to maintain the nesting. Like, look at it as a as big JSON of some formatted data or something, or so some big XML. What, user space waits until everything is there before it interprets it? Yeah. So, which, uh, so we're turning into NetLink this? into a streaming uh, protocol Sorry? then. Where did you run into this? I'm curious. Um, in the, in DevLink Health mechanism, yeah. yeah, for dumping the, the firmware. Yeah, because so I, I've gone through, like, even the IPMR, I don't think the nesting continues on multiple SKBs, right? It's just entries. Yeah, you have to you have to still end the nest until you open another one in yeah. another SKB. Uh, there is also one example uh, which is already causing some trouble and is probably going to cause much more trouble very soon, which is the IFLA VF in full list yeah. Yeah. attribute, which is nested attribute, so it's limited to 64 kilobytes. Yeah, mm -hmm. but even now, we are really getting close to that with something like 250 but VFs can, okay. per device. But can yeah. one interface hit that limit, like 64? Uh, we are close to because, that. Okay. Uh, yeah. When I counted it, uh, this, uh, it was something like you would need something like 270 VFs, VFs on, an to, on an interface to, to hit that, hit that limit, limit for attribute yeah. size. Okay. I think so that's a real problem. Yeah. And yeah. it's already causing a problem because we have very big messages which is causing trouble in IP2 or yeah. the, so Got it. Yeah, I can see how that SRIOV case can. So, so the problem okay, is uh, we can say that it's a bad design. It, it was mm. designed badly. It, it is bad yeah. design, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that was yeah. bad design. But do we have a generic problem? So the issue is you can't fit something in a TLB. You only have 64K. What is that? The length is 16 bits. The message is much bigger than 16 bits can hold. Is that? Yep. Message can, not uh, a message can be bigger than 64 kilobytes, but right. not a nested attribute. 
because attribute size is a 16 bit number. Right, so, but I in other words, if you have a table with a million entries, we don't have this problem today. They are nested, but I just keep sending them in chunks until yeah, they get there. Yeah, but once but you have a nested right? attribute with many attributes in it, yeah. then I you see. are in trouble. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay, okay. Attribute with this is, you're talking about this arrow, uh, this RIOV. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Someone thought there'll never be more than 63. If a, see, for your TC and even FDB, it's a different attribute. Sorry. Different entry, right? It's right. not the nesting does not continue up to 64 KB. That's the thing. Sorry, okay, maybe, I, I maybe want to come back on. to your solution again. I'm sorry. Maybe yeah. maybe it makes sense now. Okay, so uh, it's another thing uh, which was briefly discussed, or well, maybe more than briefly discussed <laughs> here. <laughs> and uh, so so this is uh, yeah, the silent ignore of the kernel that was uh, discussed. I think that uh, maybe it would be good to at least have like. Uh, um, an X tag or something which would, the, the kernel would say, I got some attributes which I didn't understand. Like the message will be okay, but I, I have these attributes which I didn't understand, at least. I don't know. It's, I, I also like to fail, but you know, it's. It's the notion maybe, that the wrong thing was, was implemented. Maybe this would work, this would help a little bit, but it, it's certainly better than silent ignore. Okay, it, it might be tricky with nesting to, to actually pinpoint all the attributes which failed, or which was ignored. So with the strict checking, you do that for newer kernels, right? Uh, only for the dumps, get, get requests. Yeah. Strict checking is strictly limited to get requests. Yeah. Oh, really? Not, why not the new messages? Time. Oh, time. Okay, but it can be done, right? Can't, can't conquer can the world used. in a day. Actually, I like <laughs> or, this or idea. One, so this is an extension to what David had, had said earlier, right? In case of... You don't do strict checking, you just want to say, I didn't do anything with these attributes. Yeah. Give me your best effort on understanding these attributes. Right. It's but like really, we have to, it's, it's more rela a relaxed way to yeah. just to fail. I mean, it, it doesn't, it, it's orthogonal. It's, it's not contradictory to what you're saying. But it, right. if you change this, it has to be an opt-in flag. So now it would be right. not get strict check, it would be a um, new strict yeah. check. Meaning, if you, don't, if you don't understand everything in this request, don't do anything. Yeah. Which again, I think that is an odd API that you opt in to the kernel doing but that something is for right. For existing API, newer API can be strict. Sure. Wrong, yes, right? and I'm so being super strict yeah. with the next top API. Yeah, exactly. So the existing API opt-in is the only option. I don't see any other option for that. Yeah. Thing. Okay, I will just be quick. Uh, one thing which we probably didn't discuss, at least I didn't get it, uh, is the when kernel is not putting some attribute. Uh, because you, 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 as a user space, you know, you don't know if the attribute is not supported or it was just not filled out. Uh, so, like, for nice example is MLA flag, which is basically unusable yeah. because you don't know if, if, the f if, if it means false mm -hmm. or if it means, like, I, I don't support it. This. Yeah, I ran into this with VXLAN yeah. recently. Yeah, so, so we have to use MLA U8, U8 yeah. with 0 or 1. It's weird, right? So almost put a, a deprecated thing on the NFLA, NFLA flag, I or NLA a, flag. I thought it was a new thing. I don't added. remember. Yeah, I don't remember either, because uh, the older VXLAN attributes don't use NLA, okay. NLA flag. They all use U8, and recently, recent attributes. Yeah, that, that is an interesting dilemma, though. You don't know if, it's, if it doesn't understand it or if it's just not set. Yeah, it's the, it's the other way around of the, pro of the problem we discussed before, right? Yeah. But I think it's also uh, important. Another thing, uh, yeah, we can we can perhaps have like some templates or something, which the, the kernel would dump the templates of the messages on, or notifications, mm -hmm. and it would say it would tell you you the can expect these format. kind of attributes from me. Yeah, it's like the John was asking for capabilities, but I was saying that a dump of all the attributes would be an empty dump. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and this is uh, also related to what you discussed already. And so in DevLink, we do dump it commands, and we just dump everything, uh, with one exception, which is uh, which is region read, and it allows you to select by an attribute. So you, you put you put as a user space, you put some attributes, and according to this attribute, you, it does the selection and the filtering of the dump. Not filtering, but it actually doesn't put data in the dump uh, when you don't need it, when you don't specify it. 
uh, for share buffer, for example, we do the filtering in user space. So we dump everything, and then in user space we, we filter it out. So it's not it's not good. <laughs> but it, this can be extended probably. But um, um, for for our purposes, I think that doing it by attribute is enough. But maybe something what uh, what 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 uh, Jamal mentioned would be would be nice. If you if you if you if you do it in some generic way, we we can use it as well. Uh, yep, that's it. I think it's it. Yep. All right. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you. So uh, what I'm talking about, uh, going to talk about is uh, conversion of uh, one of the old uh, network configuration tool, ETH tool, namely, to Netlink, because it's one of the last well-known tools which doesn't use Netlink these days, and it's causing a lot of trouble. So uh, when we are talking about ETH tool, we have two, oh, sorry. We have two interfaces to talk about. Uh, what I'm interested in, uh, about now is the upper interface between the generic ETH2 code in kernel and the user space ETH2 utility, which is currently implemented via IOCTL, which causes a lot of problems. Then there is a second interface, which is not so interesting now, but it still affects the way the Netlink implementation is done. And that's ETH2 Ops, which is the interface between this generic code and network uh, drivers. So uh, this is what the picture used to look like for long, where we have the ETH2 utility in user space. But we shouldn't forget that these days ETH2 is not the only user space utility using the interface. So we have. Others like Wicked, SystemD, NetworkD, Network Manager, and many distributions are, for various reasons, moving to some configuration management demons, which make things more complicated. Okay. Oh. Oh, wrong button. <laughs> so uh, these are the goals, the main goals for. Netlink API for the new Netlink based API. And these goals directly uh, correspond to the main problems with this existing IOCTL interface. Uh, the first and the most visible problem with the IOCTL interface is the extensibility, or rather, lack of extensibility. Most of the interfaces, most of the commands are not extensible at all and some in very limited way. If you remember in the morning when Sergio was talking about uh, TCP, TCP info structure, which can be only appended to, the ETH tool IOCTL interface is much worse because you don't have the structure size which served as kind of interface version, so you cannot even append. You can only fill the holes. So, if you don't have any holes, well, if you want to add an attribute, you have to add a new command. And this is what happened many times in the past. That's bad. So with Netlink, you can easily add new attributes to extend the interface, to add new parameters, new information, and so on. Uh, the proposed Netlink API also works with uh, bit sets of arbitrary size, so not limited to the 32-bit bit fields, well, mostly. Uh, we don't have uh, fixed size strings. 
Uh, second big problem of the old ECH tool interface is the error reporting because the only information, the only error reporting you have with the old interface is the numeric error code. So that you, when you get E involved, for example, that means some parameter you wanted to set was wrong. Which parameter and what was wrong with it? No idea. Uh, that's very bad. Uh, some of the drivers put this information into kernel log via print key, uh, which is not really a good interface for, the, for user errors or admin errors. So with Netlink, we can use XTAC for error reporting or for warnings. Another problem of the old interface is the read, modify, write cycle, because if you want to change one parameter, you have to retrieve the whole structure, change the value of that one parameter, and send the whole structure back. When two user space processes do the same with the same structure at the same time, you are in trouble. And okay, in the old times when there was only ETH tool, well, you wouldn't do that. But today, when you have demons in the background, it can happen. Uh, there is still a read, modify, write cycle in the Netlink API impl implementation we have, but uh, uh, it's only in kernel between the generic kernel code and network driver. And as everything is done under RTNA lock at the time, uh, there is no sp place for races. Ah, we have notifications. That's another problem we had with IOCTL. If you are using things like IP monitor or other uh, tools you, uh, monitoring events and what is changing in the system, uh, one of the new uh, things in, the, in this new Netlink API is that it allows notifications on changes, both on changes done via the Netlink interface and changes uh, done via the old IOCTL interface. In some cases, like say in the features, it's also on changes done by other uh, tools or other uh, interfaces. Uh, this, is, uh, this works really nicely. There is one big difference uh, uh, when the change is done via Netlink interface, uh, you get a notification only if something really does change because you have the information about the old state and the new state, so you know whether you did change something. Uh, if you are changing in via the legacy IOCTL interface, you don't have that kind of information in the notification, so you have to send the notification always when someone tried to change something. And uh, there are, okay, uh, another, advantage is that uh, there is less need for kernel and user space code to be in sense. So for example, when a new link mode is added, uh, you don't have to update user space and there are some, some other things like that. And last but not least, uh, there was a mention of the documentation in the pre-noon session. So uh, I tried an approach which is, which is quite unusual for me. Uh, which is that I try to start with the documentation. So whenever I add a new, new command, I try to document the API first and then implement it according to the documentation. It helped me a lot already, many times. Okay. Hmm. Ah. Okay, so some implementation details. So. Uh, the API is using General Netlink, a family named ETH tool. There are three kind of commands, starting with prefix get, set, or act. Get is for retrieving information. Set is for setting parameters. Uh, these come in pairs because the set messages are also used as the replies for the get commands. So there are some set commands which do not really correspond to actually setting something, okay, which is something Yiri was talking about already. So I didn't um, forget to make the same mistake. And act are actions which are not really sending or receiving data, for example, like device reset or 
physical identification by blinking the LED or so. And the, set, the same set messages are also used for notification, which makes user space, writing user space monitor easier. Uh, so actually the uh, user space code for ETH2 monitor, uh, I was able to write while waiting for the plane after the last NetDev conference in the mall in Montreal. Uh, we uh, use nested attributes yeah, are used a lot to structure the information better and to handle that better. Uh, the implementation is split into multiple files because it would be too long. The problem is that the old interface was using essentially the same structure for talking between user space and generic ETH tool code in kernel and between generic ETH tool code in kernel and network drivers. We don't have that luxury, so the code is more complicated. And the implementation is optional, so there is a config option for that. Well, there is not yet. What I'm talking about is just in a form of a patch set that I'm going to submit later today. But there have already been uh, three uh, RFC submissions. Uh, in parallel, I'm re-implementing the user space ETH2 utility. Okay. So, uh, current status, uh, well, uh, now I'm in the, what I call the phase one, where the goal of phase one and the end of phase one should be that we have ETH2 implementation which doesn't use or doesn't have to use IOCTL at all both in kernel and in user space. So what is missing to that goal? Uh, oh, there are still a few comments missing and some of them a bit tricky, but we are, uh, we are already in the state where it was easier to list things, that, uh, list things that are missing than list things that are done, which is encouraging, I must say. So, some open questions. Yeah, one of the open questions is the relationship between HTH tool and DevLink, because traditionally ETH tool implements some features which would rather belong to DevLink. One example was the flashing, but there are more like that. Now the question is what, on which level we are doing, uh, going to use DevLink to implement ETH tool feature. Well. One, uh, one option is that the generic ETH tool code in kernel would call devlink code or devlink callbacks. Uh, problem is that we, will, we would have two different user space APIs for the same feature, same function, which is not really desirable. Second option would be that user space ETH tool would use devlink socket and devlink commands to implement the feature. The problem here is there are two problems. Uh, more complicated user space code, which is not really critical. Uh, what, what I find far, uh, worse is that there is currently limited devlink support in uh, NIC drivers. In particular, I checked, net next, checked the, the NetNext 3 yesterday evening, and there are devlink, some devlink support is only in six NIC drivers from four dev vendors, uh, seven if you count NetDev Sim, so, which is not much, and I think it would take quite a lot of time until all network drivers would support DevLink and DevLink implementation of necessary so Mike, features. So Michael, yeah, I, I actually prefer C as well. I wanted to comment on your patches, but uh, do you? Why do you see it being a problem that drivers will move to it slowly? Because oh, uh, what I would like to achieve in some near future would be a state where we could actually make the IOCTL interface optional and will, would be able to implement everything that ETH tool does now uh, in without IOCTL. Okay. And uh, with B or C, that, um, I'm afraid, would take quite a lot of time. Okay. And quite a lot of work, but even if we only care about the in-tree drivers. Yeah, 
So the thing is with option C, it also gives us... Ah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, let me say a few words yeah. first. Uh, the option C would be uh, to either replace ETH tool by a new utility with clearer syntax or uh, not implement those uh, commands or at all. Uh, the problem I see with this, the biggest problem with this uh, that I see is that... Uh, Tools like if config are now obsolete for 20 years, and there are still people using them, and those people mostly use the excuse that they don't want to learn something new, something they are not used to, even if they only learned about it five years ago. Mm -hmm. And I'm afraid that if we remove functionality from ETH tool or replace ETH tool by a new utility completely, we would be in exactly the same situation as we were in those legacy utilities. Yeah, it'll take 20 years, but I think our config is finally going. We moved. <laughs> we recently found some script. Yeah, only a few yeah. years ago, there started to be distributions which don't install it by default, mm -hmm. like two or three years. So. so because, yeah, I saw firmware management, all that moved to DevLink, right, already. Yeah. And I understand if people yeah, are using uh, utilities. There is, there is another problem with the DevLink uh, for, I think, most users, for many users, or not, not so skilled users is that it uses different uh, uh, different handles. Mm -hmm. So people are kind of used to the network device names and the correspondence between the network device names uh, and the devlink handles, devlink which are, uh, which are uh, bound to the bus and mm -hmm. device naming mm -hmm. uh, is not so straightforward for many people. I, Personally, I have the same problem with the IW utility. Hmm. Yeah, well, the bridge, ut bridge and BRCTL also have yeah. the similar, similar problems. Yeah. Format. Okay. So, some more. Well, some more open problems for discussion or for thinking about. Uh, at the moment, XTAC is only used for reporting code uh, detected by the generic code, nor not the, not the co problems like parameter problems detected at the NIC driver level because there is no XTAC support in the ETH loops. So there is something that I would like to address eventually in, say, phase, one, phase two. Uh, there are still some Bitfield 32 attributes, and the question is whether these are future safe, like uh, message types or... Uh, wake on LAN types, uh, maybe we should use uh, arbitrary size bit, uh, bit sets everywhere. The statistics, those are not implemented yet, uh, but I'm thinking about whether the 32-bit statistics are not a bit uh, outdated. <laughs> ah, interesting idea that only occurred to me while uh, reading the program of this conference was that the 32-bit field for link speed allows, because of some limitations historic, only speeds up to two terabits, which seems quite a lot, but as there is going to be a talk about 400 gigabit Ethernet, it's not really that far. Sorry, what so we might want to think about it a bit. What do you say is wrong with NLA bit field? NLA bit field is broken, you say, it, or what's the problem? No, no, the problem is that NLA bit field is uh, limited to 32 bits. So if there are new, say, wake on lamp in types, so we are at, I think, eight at the moment, but, uh, uh, well, we are designing now the interface for future. So oh the yeah. question so is... You, you can add another one, basically. Uh, LA, uh, yeah, bits. sure, but uh, it would be... I think we looked, uh, David and I did have this conversation when we asked, eventually said, okay, let's just, I don't, we don't need more than three bits right now, so let's make it 32 bit. But there's actually a library, I think, in the kernel you could, for bitmaps that you can make it grow as much as you want. Yeah. So, but it was very complicated, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it makes things a bit more complicated. There was some reason why it was changed for enum to actual speed. Uh, one thing I was thinking about is that we are actually using only some 
the speed. So maybe we could use something like speed and uh, offset. So we've hit this a few times, like for uh, table. Table ID used to be a U8 inside the uh, RT yeah. message, and now it's a 32-bit attribute appended to the route messages. So there, yeah, there, there are solutions for that. Yeah. Flipping over from the, the old to yeah, the Yeah, those are things that uh, yeah. we should think about. And people running speeds fire th uh, faster than that would have to have new tools, so. Yeah, yeah of course, the internal uh, kernel uh, interfaces use 32-bit everywhere, so the rewrite would have to be massive anyway. But it's something to think about. Yeah, so some ideas what we could think about uh, after phase one is finished. So uh, we should do no more extensions to the IOCTL interface to kind of push people to use the uh -huh. Netlink one. Ah, yeah, make it optional. Uh, and convince others to use the space tools to use Netlink, which uh, may be harder than it seems, because I remember when I was backporting the uh, Netlink interface for bonding configuration to SLE 12, uh, I mentioned that to people working on Wicked, and they said, oh, that's great, that will save us a lot of work. Uh, about a month ago, I ch checked the Wicked code, and I uh, was surprised that uh, to this day it's still using SysCTL, uh, uh, SysFS interface to configure the bonding. So <laughs> it may be harder than it seems. Yeah, then we might start reverting ETH tool ops, mostly to, uh, to add XTAC supports for error reporting and better extensibility. Those, uh, some features, I'm pretty sure there will come some features which are currently kind of blocked by IOCTL interface deficiencies. And there were some ideas uh, within last year about structured statistics or structured offloading flags. So that's something that will be more open now. Uh, yeah, uh, it will be nice to get rid, of, uh, get rid of RTNL lock, which is currently used around ETH2 ops. The problem is that for years or maybe rather decades now, the ETH2 ops in drivers were written under the impression that you can rely on RTNL lock. So it may be a problem. Ah, yeah, Wireshard sector would be really uh, yeah. nice. Have you, have you looked at uh, S-Stress over here? Excuse me, yeah? S-Stress, why, why do you need Wireshard? I mean, S-Stress is actually the new modern S-Stress, knows how to deal with Netlink. I was kind of very impressed. They have a lot of bugs misreporting things, sending them a patch, they have this process I couldn't keep up. <laughs> so I sent them a patch a couple of times to fix the neighbor messages. Mm -hmm. But it's amazing. Uh, you should take a look at it instead of Wireshark. Uh, yeah. Nice. Uh, currently, Estes, just download the latest uh, For my debugging, I'm actually using, uh, I added an option to HTA to ATH tool so that it dumps both outgoing and coming Netlink messages in some readable format. Yeah, but, uh, uh, you should probably think about contributing it to S-Stress, yeah. which is a much widely used okay. tool. Probably. I, will, I will check, definitely. I never heard about it before. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I was surprised the first time I saw it. Okay. So uh, here you can find some links. Uh, so as I said, I'm, uh, well, I planned to submit the V4 uh, yesterday, but I did some last minute change, so I need to update the cover letter, but hopefully I will be able to submit the patch set today, later, or first part of the patch set, because I have some more, but so uh, currently I'm at something like 45 patches, which would be too long to submit at once. And there is a conf uh, presentation from Susa Labs conference last uh, September. So, thank you for attention, and we have something like minus eight yeah. minutes for questions. <laughs> I, I so you can find me in the lobby or... Yeah, thanks, anywhere. Michael. Thank so I think in, in general, yes, we did run over a little bit on our time slot. Uh, it was a break after this, before the TC workshop starts, so we have a few minutes. Uh, thanks, everyone, for attending. If anyone has suggestions on implementing any of the things that were proposed, you know, Feel free, give it a shot, try it, send some patches. Um, other than that, I guess you know we, we have other topics that we could be getting into. So hopefully we'll be doing other work, other workshops that 
future conferences.